Well, beautiful. It's Wednesday. It's uh, it's fall. Everything's kind of changing to the holiday festivities, and the end of the year is fast approaching. So that means a lot of us are probably rethinking some of the goals that we put into play this this year. Um, but I, I love doing these community meetups because they kind of allow us to to see where others are, hear about silver linings, and then just hear stories of people that have actually nailed those goals down and made it happen. Um, and so we just love having the community members that are either here live or listening to us later. Um, and part of this is it's a community conversation, right? So what we want to do is invite people to, to have a conversation with our guests. This week, we've got Liz. Uh, she's my good friend. She is a founder of a software platform called Nano. Um, I'm really excited for you guys to hear her story. It's pretty cool. She's, uh, she's doing us uh, a bit of good by tuning in from London while she's on vacation. So we are so appreciative of her for that. Um, Liz, before we get started, we love to have the community members that are here kind of introduce themselves so that you know who he, who's here to support you. And, uh, and then we'll have you introduce yourself. So I can go first. My name is Adam Griggs. Uh, I am the co-founder of Clarify and I am your moderator today. And I am very appreciative to all of you for joining us. Uh, and I will turn it over to Rachel. Hey, Liz, I'm super impressed that you're here with us, especially on vacation. So would love to hear more about that. But um, I'm Rachel McCool from GoDaddy. Um, I manage community experiences and part of my, my scope is this amazing group um, that we have on LinkedIn and just work really closely with customers on, you know, hearing what's going on with you and how can we as a company kind of help. Um, so I love these meetups, love to get to know people and, and hear your stories. So looking forward to, to hearing from you today. Cool. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks. We'll have Emma and then Patrick. Hi, Liz. I'm Emma Lawrence. I am founder of Life is Coaching You, which is my life coaching business. And I specialize in millennial burnout, helping millennials who've gotten burned out at work be able to transition to a joyful, sustainable life of service. Really excited to hear your story today. So thank you. And I love London. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> have you had a plowman's yet? No, but that's a good point. I should. <laughs> Liz, uh, Patrick Kagan. I'm the founder of PK Solutions Group, and we specialize in uh, print solutions and uh, business and personal consulting. Uh, and I'm super excited to hear about your story. The, <clears throat> the preview that Adam sent out was really, you know, really good, really intriguing. And anybody who's going to call in from vacation overseas, I, I got to tune in and listen. So thanks. <laughs> very much for joining us today. Sure thing. And I'm not, I mean, I am kind of on vacation, but I do these little trips where it's really the vacation part is the weekends. And then in the middle of the week, I do, you know, it's fun to be in a new place for dinner and stuff, but I've been working. So don't give me too much credit. <laughs> I love that. That's a great lead into what is Nano and how you can do that. I mean, talk to us about, about Liz, about your story and how you created Nano that's allowing you the lifestyle you have today. Um, and then we'll get into kind of the mission that Nano is, if that's all right. Sure. Um, so how we, well, first of all, I should tell you what Nano is. If you don't already know, it's an on-demand childcare app. So it's like Uber or Lyft, but for getting a babysitter instead of getting a car. Um, and so we have thousands of babysitters all over the U.S. Um, we have, um, let's see, we've been, we, we're everywhere in the country. And I started Nano because of a mission that I personally had as a working mom, feeling like family management and tech and all of that was such an underserved part of the technology landscape. And I still really think that's the case. I think just in the past few years, there have been a lot of companies coming out trying to innovate in this space. Um, it's a really hard place, honestly. Like when I first started trying to raise money and we had lots of investors telling us all the things that were going to make our company not work all of the things that they said were true. And every every bad thing that they said was gonna happen did happen and has happened. And we just keep on working through it. So that's sort of my daily game of whack-a-mole. But, um, but I think it's really important. And from a, like a mission perspective, I, I think, you know, if we don't step in to solve these problems, no one will. Like no one is, is thinking that they're gonna 
make this giant technology company to do this just because it's profitable. I mean, it is profitable, but it's not, obviously there's more glamorous things you could be doing than getting babysitters, um, but it's just so needed. And we have a lot of, you know, a lot of feedback from our users telling us how important this is to them and how, how much better their life is now that they have this product. So that makes it all worthwhile. But, um, but it really, I, I really do believe that the family tech industry as a whole is one of the last sort of frontiers in technology of trying to solve human problems with technology. And so it's an exciting place to be right now. Yeah, I love that. Um, I, I got to touch on a few things there. First of all, thank you for the transparency and vulnerability and sharing with us that in fact, everybody that advised you said bad things were going to happen and they did happen and you still pursued and pushed on that. Um, and I, I just love what you built because your mission is to help parents have it all. And I think that that's an important tagline because we balance so much in our lives. And usually the balance is hard decisions, right? What we can have, what we should have, what we shouldn't have, or what people say we shouldn't have. Those are always not always synonymous, right? So I love that that's kind of your mission and your megaphone. Um, talk to us about, you know, why you created nano as it is as a tech platform and and kind of where that's leading as far as you for a vocal advocate for families and kind of making things possible in the new normal so yeah i think that there's definitely a lot of in, in a way there's a lot of shame still so i mean not to get too wonky on the all the feminist aspects of this because that could just be our whole entire discussion and we don't need to go too far into it, but there's still so many things that I think women feel guilty about even being allowed to try to juggle and get, you know, their own needs worked into the equation of everyone else's needs that they're taking care of. And, um, and so I think that there's, and, and even just the idea of being able to have your own time to yourself, I think we still have a lot of guilt. So even those of us who consider ourselves feminist, at, you know, at least me, I still find myself sometimes still falling back into those same traps of thinking, like, should I really be allowed to do this? Like, should I, like I, when I was leaving to come to London. So just if you guys want to know my situation, um, I'm divorced, which is why I can do these trips because I, my, I have my kids every other week. And so when I don't have them, I can, you know, they're with their dad, they're going to be with their dad, whether I'm in Denver or not. So I can go do these fun things in that period of time. Um, but, but saying like, should I just be allowed to do this? Should I just be allowed to get on a plane and go spend a week in London? And, you know, all of these things, I feel like we don't give ourselves permission to try to do. And I also think there's a lot of, um, reluctance in the marketplace like a lot of the things besides the investors with very good points on all the challenges that there are building in this space which were true um there's also just a lot of hostility to the model and sometimes it was even female investors that would get even more upset than male investors like you shouldn't even be trying to do that that's not a thing that people should ever do because they think it's not safe or whatever and our you know obviously as a mom myself a huge part of what we built was all the safety that we needed to have in order to make it safe and and i really right now can st can say um, with a lot of confidence that I think that what we have is safer is the safest way to get a babysitter like wh what we do the vetting that we do no one else does this level of vetting like at all um so I think that you know figuring out a way to to surmount those arguments and say okay look I know you have objections but they're all objections that I can handle and that we can make you know not only meet your um, fears and and make them less scary, but also actually make a product that's even better at those things than what you were worried about. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I do think that it's like it's one of those cultural things that, in order, you know, Nano still isn't as big as I hope it one day will be, where it's just like a no brainer that everyone is using it. There's still a lot of reluctance, and I think, you know, if Uber and Lyft hadn't been so strong in the beginning in their messaging and in their in their broad adoption. Um, it would have taken a long time for people to get their minds around the idea of car sharing and ride sharing too, and Airbnb and all these things. Um, so I'm hoping, so to me, part of my big mission is if if we make Nano into a household name and everybody really knows that they can use this and there's a sort of social and cultural legitimacy around it, not only will that be obviously awesome for my business, but it will also be awesome for everyone because it's not just about having an asset, it's about being able and feeling entitled to use it. Yeah, no, I, I love your conviction, first of all, just, just in your mission and what you're building. Um, and people do have a reluctance, right? We, we feel guilty when we're trying to balance what our choices are in front of us and what, it, what the impact might be for those that are immediately around us or even further, um, especially when it comes to like the social environment, you know, what is acceptable and what's not. And, you know, it, it's funny that you mentioned 
the journey and the trajectory of, of like Uber and Lyft, because, you know, as a child, we're, we're taught, don't talk to strangers on the internet, don't get in strangers' cars. Now we get on the internet, talk to a stranger and get in their car, right? Right. So <laughs> th- things like, do- I mean, Uber is glorified hitchhiking, really, at yeah. the end of the day, right? <laughs> And, and things do kind of change and, and pivot based on what the needs are and, and the safety measures that are put into place. So I'm glad that you mentioned that because not only did you have an idea that would impact the family and the family's ability to adapt and grow and give everybody the option to have a good work life or lifestyle balance, but you're doing it in an environment that is highly challenging, right? I mean, the, the social norms here are you don't get online and send strangers into your house to take care of your kids. Um, and if we're going to allow people to pursue careers of passion, or if we're going to allow balance in the household where maybe both spouses can pursue what they want to do, we have to be able to open ourselves up to that. And I just, I love, I love your mission for that. I can't, I know I'm gushing over that, but I just love what you've built. So thank you for that. Thanks. So I, I want to ask you a question and this is always, uh, you know, top of mind when somebody has an idea. And they, they know they want to run with it and make a business out of it. What is the point or the cliff that you know, I'm going to make this jump? And how do they move past that initial fear of, like you said, going from idea to incubation to actual you know, product? I think everyone follows their own path. And I, I, I sort of bristle when other people tell me like, this is what you should all do, because I think that's silly and, and different people do different things. But so I'll just tell you what I think and, and not really what I did, but what I now think I should have done. Um, so I think that in a lot of types of businesses, and this is the advice I give everyone who's like, I have this great idea. And what I think I'm going to do is go raise tons of money based on it. Um, and then on the other hand, like, oh, I'm just going to bootstrap it and, and, and get it to this amazing high level before I ever raise any money. I think that for me, my, this is my opinion only, um, obviously, is try to prove as much of it as you can yourself without having to raise money and without having to quit your day job, frankly, and just see how much of it you can prove and not just for yourself. Well, partly to prove your own passion, right? Like if you're not willing to do this at night after your kids are in bed or on the weekends or whatever, you're probably not passionate enough. And if you don't have that level of passion, you and but I also think that there are so many things that people can prove on a business idea um, before they a commit themselves, their own time investment and all that. Um, but also before at, once they have gotten certain things proven out for themselves, like, you know, market and all those different things, their ability to go to market, the receptivity of the market and their messaging, the way that they want to position it. Um, once they've really sort of worked that stuff out, not only will that help them to really figure out whether they like do their own internal soul searching and decide whether they want to make the leap, but it will also help convince investors, right? So it's not just an idea at that point. It's an idea that you have proven in certain ways and you've gotten this small amount of traction and you've gotten this, you know, way of indica- indicating that that traction could be um, could be grown and expanded and scaled. So to me, I think that like that's when, when we first started Nano, we had such a complicated idea of what we wanted it to be. Um, and, and there was lots of trust stuff that we wanted to test and, I, and a lot of networking stuff that ended up being totally useless. But in the beginning, we were like, everyone's got to be able to network with each other inside of there and it's got to be able to do all this stuff. So we just built a whole lot more than we should have coming out of the gate. And everyone told us not to, but I, and I was like, I get it, but we really need this to work the way it's going to really work so that we can test whether people really want to use it. Um, But what I didn't realize is that we could have tested a much smaller hypothesis first. And, and, and if we had, then we would have had a different, you know, sort of maybe a little different path. Um, But the whole fully blown version of your idea does not need to be on the table from day one, like figure out how to break it into incremental pieces, test out the parts that you can easily test, get the sort of iterate based on those types of things. And then, you know, once you've done that exercise, you'll have the internal, conversation with yourself having done that about whether or not this is something that you really actually want to invest your own time in I mean two million dollars of investment we've gotten for nano and that's a lot and I'm excited that we've had that that's why we've been able to do what we've been able to do but my personal last five years in my opinion and probably also on paper because I used to be a lawyer is worth more than that right like my ability to actually keep on doing this every single day is the biggest investment that anyone has made in this company. And I think that most people 
have, you know, that's the thing that they have to test out. Like people have these fantasies about being startup founders. And I know that we're not only talking about startups, but people have these fantasies, like it's going to be this amazing thing. But now I've been doing this for five years and I will tell you the one, one of the people I envy the least in this world is Mark Zuckerberg. I would not want to be him for the world. Like not even just all the crazy new things that have been happening recently, but that like he started this in college, he'll never be able to do anything else. Like, yeah, he'll probably go to the moon and all these fancy things, but like he's basically locked himself into this for the rest of his life. And I think that that's something that people should really take seriously before they embark upon these kinds of things. I have, wow, I have a lot of, lot of things. First of all, you just, I was going to ask you what your background was before you ventured into this. And you just mentioned you were a lawyer. Were you a corporate lawyer or mm-hmm. what, what you were? Yeah, I was a startup lawyer. Oh, you were a startup lawyer. Yeah. Okay. Well, that gives you a lot of really good background. I was going to also ask you because <clears throat> I live in San Francisco <clears throat> and around a lot of obviously investors, um, was going to ask you how challenging it has been for you to raise money, because a lot of times women have more challenges raising money than men do. Um, and then also, what other challenges have you encountered as a woman, um, as a startup founder? Just And I'm just asking you that because I, I have known a lot of challenges, um, not only for women, but for men as well, just being startup founders. Yes, all of that stuff is really, they're all good points. Um, so on the fundraising aspect, um, I, ha- I have never really raised a significant amount of money from, from VCs. So almost all of our money, really, I, really I should say all of it, that we've raised has come from, so we have some institutional investors, but those were accelerator programs. So, I mean, they're great networks to have, but it wasn't a, a real VC raise. Um, almost all of our money came from crowdfunding. So we did an equity crowdfunding raise. And when I was a secure, so I started my career as a securities lawyer, you know, representing public companies in New York. My first, that was my first job out of law school. And I've always had, you know, securities law in my practice. And so when the Jobs Act came out and we started doing this crowdfunding stuff and all the lawyers were like, no one's ever going to use this. It's crazy. It's so risky. It's a terrible idea. I was like, they're totally going to use it. And I was so excited about it from a legal perspective. So Later, when I got the opportunity to do it for my own company, I did, and we raised, we were one of the first female founded companies to raise the statutory maximum at the time, which was a million, a little over a million. Now it's 5 million you can raise in equity crowdfunding. So that's a real, a real source of early capital for people. And I think for women and other people trying to solve these tricky problems, like, so I would go to VCs and I would talk, I had so many meetings and I really like them. Like I, I spend a lot of time in San Francisco also, and I really enjoyed these conversations. But like I said, they were pointing out all the things that were going to go wrong, which they were totally right about. Uh, and how did they know that I was going to, you know, just decide to keep on rallying every day and trying to solve every new problem. Um, so everything that they said was going to happen, happened. And also they, there are so many other things they can invest in, you know, like that they feel more personally attached to that are easier, that are SaaS products that you just build some, pro- some, some software and it just floated out into the world and you never have to manage it again. And so, and at the end of the day, like I was, I started envying all the people who did have those kinds of companies, but the fact is I wanted to do the company that I am doing because I really felt like it needed to be done. Like, were there other companies I could have done that would have been easier? Yes, of course there were. And sometimes I wish I had done that, but, um, but, but the idea of being motivated by this kind of a mission is, is really, you know, that obviously that's, that drives me. It doesn't drive most VC investors, which is fine. They don't have to, that's not how they choose to run their business. They don't have to do that. Unfortunately, we also find found ourselves on the wrong side of the impact investor community because there's all these people who want to invest in impact, but they were like, your problem that you're solving mostly just helps white women who want to have a, a life and also kids and a career. And that's just not like impactful enough for us. And I was like, you know what? I think you're wrong, but I get it. Like there's definitely you know, bigger causes that you could be funding. So from that perspective, we never really could get anything to work. But what we did get to work was crowdfunding. And I think this is a great vehicle for people like me that are trying to solve like real everyday problems that every everyday people can understand, um, that, that everyday people can see the need for. You know, I would go to investors and they'd say, well, what about care.com? Okay, so they thought that because that's another company in the world that is big and does something similar. But regular parents knew that care.com wasn't doing the thing that we were doing. Like they understood our value props so much better because they're regular people. And so I feel like for, for female founders who are having trouble 
convincing, you know, the, the typical white male VC community or just anybody in the VC community to, to understand the value prop of their idea. Um, a lot of the time you go to the, the crowd and that's just the regular people. That's, that's validating the investors that we got from the crowdfunding validated our concept almost as much as our users did, right? Like they were saying, yes, we see the need for this. And um, the messaging to them also was the same messaging that we used to our customers. So I do really think of crowdfunding as a huge um, benefit for people in the situation, consumer facing products that people can understand that VCs don't find really like exciting to invest in. Um, and I think it's gaining a lot more sort of credibility as an early stage financing um, opportunity that then can, you can raise venture capital after that. That was one of the things everyone used to say about crowdfunding, like, oh, well, once you go down that road, no VC is ever going to touch your deal. And that's being proven all the time not to be true. Like once you, you know, get to a certain point in your traction and your metrics, and you've been able to prove all this stuff with the, you know, support of the early crowdfunding, then VCs still are interested and the way that they're structuring these deals is not scary and that, you know, they're able to invest and follow on rounds. So um, that, that was my experience. And I also think, I hope, and I think it's a trend that is, you know, going to continue to, to bear out. Well, thank you for the share. And Rachel, great question. You know, I'm, I'm reading a book right now called Originals, and it's about how nonconformists change the world. And they did a study in this book based on people who actually make the, the decision to launch their business. And more often than not, the more successful ones were ones that hedged their bets. Back to what you said, Liz, with the you know, testing out the market, making sure that you've got some proof of concept before you go. Like some of the biggest providers like Warby Parker was one of the ones they did in the book. Um, these guys kept their jobs. They kept internships. They kept doing, you know, they didn't drop out of college like some of the big startup names we've been taught to follow and drool after, right? Um, and they, they hedged their bets until they knew that they were ready to build something meaningful and they could actually, you know, make stride, you know, move forward. Um, and I think that's important. Everybody thinks that if you build it, they will come. Well, you got to make sure that they know where to go first, right? So like you said, having the available audience and perspective, that's great. And I love to share on the, the, the struggles that you had in trying to raise capital and talking to VCs and how direct they were and how you were able to work with crowdfunding. Because I feel like if your audience aligns and you've got a meaningful product and you've proven yourself to be a tenacious go-getter who, who has a product that can really change and impact people, there's opportunity there. And for people like me, that excites me. You did, you did mention SaaS. I have a SaaS company, but it's still, it's still hard work, right? So I love that. And I love that that's been your story and your mantra. Um, and I, and I, I got to just appreciate you for being an advisor as well, right? So you've, you've gone from idea to concept and you're building and you've got this, this following and you've still got so much on your plate for building out your company, but you're advising people too. So I've got to ask you why, like, why do you want to advise people, Liz, at this stage? You know, I have this personality type, I guess, um, that if I can do something, I just want to do it. I don't know. You know, like, you know, when you're just like walking along and you see some like random garbage and you put it or like the garbage can is tilted over and you put it back up, like that sort of personality of like, I don't, I mean, it's not that hard. I'll just do it. Right. Like someone's got to do it and I'm right here. So why don't I just do it? Um, so, so I don't know. I think if I can help other people, I mean, I especially like to help entrepreneurs. I, I especially like to help people who are doing crowdfunding. Obviously that's like, it's becoming a really big passion of mine um, to just help people get access to that source of capital. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just, I feel like you always have some time, you know, you know, they always say, you know, if you need something done, find the busiest person you can find. Like it also is that it's like, I'm always doing something right. Like I'm always moving. I'm always sort of like engaging in a new thing. And I feel like if I slow down, then I would suddenly get tired. But as long as I keep on going, you know, it just, it keeps on going. And also I think it's good to have community around you. It's very, it's very isolating being a founder. Like it really is even it doesn't really matter how many other people you have around you. Nobody really gets the founder journey except for other founders. And 
So you go to parties and everyone's like, oh, it's so cool what you're doing. You know, I want to hear all about it. And you're like, I don't really want to talk about it to you because I know you're really not going to understand it all. And it's just going to make me feel empty inside. But then when you actually engage with other people who are doing it, it's like so empowering and so fun. Like every, even totally different kinds of companies. Like I've done two accelerators with Nano. One of them was 500 startups I did in 2019. And I loved it. And I, I still keep in touch with all of the people in my batch from that because even though the companies were so different, it was still like everyone is still dealing with different things. And some people have exited and we're all so happy for them. And some people have closed up shop and we're like, cool, you're going to do the next thing. Um, and some of us are still toiling at various stages in our businesses, but it's just that sense of community. Like you don't get to have that unless you're going to participate in it, I think, you know? So that's why I do a lot of, you know, I try to stay involved with my founder communities as much as I can, because really not only are they the only ones who understand, but also they are the only ones who know anything. If it's like, if you want to go and say, oh, well, what, you know, what are you using for this right now? Right. Or like, what are you hearing from investors? If you tell them this right now, everything in startup world changes so quickly. Anybody who thinks that they know everything about it because they did it before, if it wasn't like this month, it's probably old news, right? Like really it's like you, keeping that sort of community of people who are all sort of doing the same kind of thing all the time is really valuable for all of us. And of course it helps us to not feel so isolated. I love it. I can tell you, you're just lit with passion um, and you have momentum. And I think I'm glad you touched on the word community. That's what we're all about. That's why we do these meetups because it's empowering to see the energy that people have in building something that's special to them, something that's meaningful. You know, we, we all have reasons why we're, we're building these companies and we're trying to push forward, but I just love your energy. And I think having a community around you is, it's more than just having that conversation. It's energy, it's conveyance, it's sharing ideas, and it's momentum. Really, at the end of the day, it is momentum. And I love that you're an advisor because of that, because you are leading so many people through the minefield. You've been through so many things that they're going to overcome, right? Um, and you're challenging the way that women in the workplace operate, and female founders, and giving people opportunity to balance life without, without having to feel guilty about it. And it all came from a concept of having a tech platform, you know, that's going to help families, right? And the impact is so much more wide scale than, than people see with just your brand. And I just, I love that. I have to appreciate you for that. Um, Thanks, Liz, for, for just everything. Rachel. Okay, so I'm going to jump in again. Um, having worked at a very early stage startup um, and having heard many stories of startup founders, um, the two things I was going to add was, I think, number one, passion is behind your idea, you have to have passion. And so really wonderful that you have that and that you, for five years, I mean, that's being a startup founder and still having your business for five years, that's amazing because a lot of people can't say they, they do that. But um, my, this is totally my personal opinion, but I think the other formula that's super important is really good leadership and integrity. And one of the things that, that has personally bothered me about a lot of um, founders who are glorified is hearing about their horrible behavior behind the scenes in connection to treating their employees badly. Um, and I, I have experienced that as well. And I have talked to many other people who I know who have worked for these types of founders. And so that's something for me personally, that's important like to, to know other founders who have integrity and who treat their people really well um, is, is super important. And one of the things that I find personally upsetting about venture capital is they don't care about that. Um, they will invest in some of the worst people in the world um, as long as they believe their idea and concept is going to make them money. Um, so that's just my, you know, my thing. So I, I'm loving what you're saying. Um, I think, you know, again, being a female founder and, and still being in there for five years, that's just amazing. And I just wish you the best. Um, see, I was just looking at your website, great website. Um, so I hope, I hope you continue to do really well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for those comments, Rachel. Um, 
Yeah. It's always great to see people's, you know, give and take and perspective in these environments when we're, we're listening to these stories that people are sharing with us and what the impact really is having on our minds and how we're seeing things. So thank you for that. Julie, do you have a question? And then Patrick? I do. Hi, Liz. I'm Julie. Sorry, I'm late. Um, I have a company I started. It's called Stick and Stack. I sell eco-friendly stickers made out of recycled water bottles. Um, they're completely unique. There's nothing like it on the market, but um, which is great. So that's part's exciting, but completely relate to the idea of trying to do too many things at once from the very beginning. Um, I was trying to solve all the world's problems, including how do I support artists and how do I go eco-friendly and how do I support creativity to the point where I actually ended up uh, starting three different businesses in one. <laughs> and so I'm in the process of spinning the other two out from stick and stock and just being really focused on the custom market because that's where I got proof of concept um, for bringing real dollars into stick and stock and knowing that that market is limitless. Um, so, and it took me a long time to figure out how to transition from wanting to help others to help myself. And so thinking about stick and suck as, oh, I'm going to help all these artists. And in the process, I will, I will also be helped, but it doesn't actually work that way in a startup. You kind of have to focus on yourself. And then when you have a little bit more capital, you can then start helping others. And so I appreciated that part of your story. And I am super curious um, and also excited to hear about the way that you did crowd crowdfunding. Um, I was turned off at first. You and I have a similar background. I was in corporate law for SaaS companies for the last uh, 15 years before I quit and started Stick and Stuck. Um, so I'm actually interested in looking that, looking towards that as an option for Stick and Stuck or for some other ideas. I'm like you, I'm a perpetual entrepreneur and always have different ideas, always moving, always thinking. And so um, I'm actually really excited to hear about your thoughts on that coming from a securities background. So thank you for sharing. I'm really glad to be here. Sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want my opinion about whether you whether you'd be good for crowdfunding I, I i will just tell you i think you would i think it's it's hard for people to raise money in crowdfunding if their idea is really esoteric or you know business focused into such a niche like it's almost like this the exact same type of people who have no trouble at all convincing vcs that like of course all the businesses need this like search engine for inside of a website to do a thing like all this like very wonky technical stuff that people that regular people can't understand but if you have an articulable message that consumers can understand, even if you don't, you aren't selling direct to consumer. I don't know if you are, um, but even if you aren't, like they, if they can understand it and they can understand your value prop and it's very accessible to them, I think that's the best. You know, that's the that those are the deals that do best on crowdfunding. So, if you want to talk more offline about the specifics, I would be happy to do that also. That'd be great. Yeah, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Love it, Patrick. I love that um, at the heart of everything, you, you first solved a problem before you came up with this concept of a business. Uh, and I love that you have perseverance uh, at the heart of everything you do. Um, I have three daughters and I've done my best uh, to try to educate them on the fact that there is a good old boys club out there and that you are a woman in this world and nothing about your gender makes you less competent uh, than others. And I, and so I, I love your story about that. I also know that like with the VC world, they're a bunch of sheeple sometimes and they want to believe what they want to believe. And my message to them, which is what I think you're a living example of is definitely pursue your passions, but do it with eyes wide open. Don't be, don't be, you know, hugging trees for the sake of hugging a tree, right? Do something beyond hugging that tree to make the world a better thing. So I know that you mentioned something about uh, how many they told you bad things would happen and they all did. And bad things can happen to good business ideas, but you bet on yourself um, and you and you persevered through that. And I think when the VC world sees something and they say no because it won't work or they don't believe, they're not betting on you to figure it out and adapt like an entrepreneur would, which is what you did. So if you just stop with that's my idea and that's as far as I go, yeah probably would fail. So my question, I haven't looked at your website yet, I'm going to bring it up, but um, who is your target audience? Who buys your solution? Is it the parent? Yep, it is. 
Um, and interestingly, more dads, maybe not more dads, but equal dads and moms. Yeah. So we definitely have, you know, both sides of the parenting spectrum. Um, and we have a lot of single parents, but our biggest demographic is double income. You know, both parents are working um, and they tend to be doctors, lawyers, and technology people. I mean, I think that that people with sort of client facing jobs where they can't afford to miss, um, they can't afford to miss work when they when their kid is sick or when they have a childcare emergency, as obviously you've had a lot in the past two years. Um, but also that understand why this why technology solutions can be effective, right? Like there is a lot of misunderstanding about what goes into building a marketplace. You know, the vetting that we all have to do, the, like what levels everyone's going to do. I, I kind of wish consumers were more educated, frankly, about what different platforms do for vetting. Um, but yeah, I think that I think that the sort of a more educated consumer base. I mean, our, our prices are not super cheap either, but I mean, we try to make them affordable. Um, but I think that people who are more educated are more also able to follow the process of what we're doing and, to, and judge, trust their own judgment and say, yeah, that actually sounds like, you know, a safe thing that you guys have figured out whether these people are going to be good caregivers. Yeah, I'm going to connect to you because there's two people that I'm connected to. One, she started an au pair business way back in the day and she's done very well. She, again, Nobody believes in that, and she figured it out and pushed through uh, and did very well. But the other, she's uh, coming out with a second book, and she consults in the daycare world, uh, and she's wildly successful. And great ideas, great, you know. And I think that the connection might be really good. Just if nothing else, to to bounce ideas off each other. So watch for my connection request so I can connect you guys, you girls. Okay, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is great conversation, and I know that we could probably talk for hours with you Liz um, and I just I appreciate you again for calling while overseas I know you've got uh, a pretty booked schedule and you've got some things you need to balance so I want to be considerate of your time and consider the time for the members that are here and is there anything that's coming up for you in the near future you want us to kind of touch on before we let go and then we'll open it up for for kind of final comments and kudos um, well, we, we did just launch our second crowdfunding raise today. So that's my news of the day. So that's exciting. Um, so you guys can go check it out. It's at republic.co slash nano. Yep. So that's, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I, you know, the past two years have not been easy in childcare, as you guys know, this is, I mean, it is really the, when, when I originally started nano, I was like, why hasn't anyone already done this? And now I'm like, now I get why they're not doing it because it's hard. It's really hard. Um, but you know, so, so we're still in the early stage startup phase of life, still trying to raise money, still trying to expand. Um, and obviously there's a lot of things that we need to do to expand, to become like to the level of household name that I think is really the success of this business that I would like to see happen. Um, so if you guys have any ideas about that at all, I would love to hear them, or, you know, you can contact me through LinkedIn or offline, um, because I'm always looking for new ideas of how to get the word out to people. Um, and yeah, we're just going to keep on doing it. I mean, I also, Adam, as you know, I've been, um, I've been thinking about employer, like more employer sponsored childcare concepts. And I'm not sure if that will be part of Nano or if it might be its own company. Um, but that's another aspect of this puzzle that has recently really started becoming important to my mind to figure out because the economics of childcare are so messed up in this country. And not so much this country that I'm in right now, England, um, but, you know, Europe has it all figured out. Canada has it all figured out. But we, you know, we put the whole burden still on families. And I think that having employers get involved in that mix is the only way this is ever going to work. It's the only way that we're going to get enough money into the into the economy of child care to make it actually a viable market. Um, so. I don't know, look for that because I'm, I'm always asking for ideas and trying to get input and feedback on, you know, how to get employers more engaged in this. Um, and I have some new ideas, maybe a new SaaS platform that I'm working on to, to make that happen. So anyway, I always like new ideas. So if anybody has any ideas to share with me, please feel free to ping me offline. Yeah, I mean, we're a community conversation matters and I love that you're challenging that. I think that uh, you are right. The economics of childcare are a little messed up and we've seen that. You know, my wife and I run business together and we have kids and we had homeschooled the last 12 months and it was rough. It was really rough. Um, and you've got people that are not just balancing their options on what they are or are not allowed to do for themselves, but their own well-being, their health, right? We push ourselves so far, so far anymore 
that at the end of the day, if we're, if we're sacrificing our health, we're not living a life of, of meaning and our, and our families are not experiencing us at our fullest. So why should we give ourselves to somebody else for 50, 60 hours a week and come home and give them the leftovers, you know? So yep. I, I love your mission. I just, I, I'm, I'm real passionate about that. Um, and thank you for, for putting out there that you're starting your next round of crowdfunding because that's, you know, Julie can follow you on that and kind of see how that, that goes too. So I love the example. Yep. Absolutely. And, and Julie, I, I'm, I am actually really honest and sincere in um, my willingness to talk about this offline with you and, and see if we can um, look at what you're doing and see if we can get you onto one of the platforms. If you, yeah, if you decide to go that great. way. Yeah, I will definitely connect. I have an idea for you okay. <laughs> already. Though. So I have kids 10 and 13, 11 and 13. I'm a single mom and I don't necessarily need a full-time babysitter, but it would be cool to have a platform with a buddy that could just check in with my kids that I would be willing to pay a, an hourly wage to connect with them and just see if they've done their homework, if I'm not here after school. And so mm. in some ways it could be um, just a virtual connection with someone for a short amount of time, which I think could help solve some families issues with older kids that need maybe just a little more community because we're having a hard time. You know, there's not as many coaches, not as many neighbors, not as many mentors that, um, that I think would be kind of a cool addition to your platform for when you have uh, people, you know, watching kids or interacting with kids. That's a great idea. I think, and that's one of the things that, that I haven't really done very much. Um, and nobody really is doing that. I know of is really just thinking about other ways of solving childcare besides the ways that we already have, right? Like I do babysitters and we do full-time nannies and part-time nannies and stuff, but like my whole marketplace is all around getting the, you know, connecting the people for the relationships that they already know about and that are, have sort of been part of our society for a long time. But, you know, as part of this whole future of childcare, maybe some less intensive, but still really, you know, well-timed help um, in ways that we haven't already been thinking about forever is, is really just another way to supplement this in a more cost-effective way where people can afford it. And they also, it really just does just the thing that you need it to and not extra things. So that's a really good idea. I will definitely keep that in mind. Yeah, get some off. I mean, they already get so much influence through YouTube and influencers that they, I think they're really looking for people to help guide them and to have someone that consistently connects with them um, at their level or is kind of cool, <laughs> you know, would be yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. And that's vetted. And so it's not just that they're going out to Minecraft and finding some random strangers who could be child molesters, but like exactly. there's actually like these people like go interact with them. And by the way, they're safe. And also, you know, maybe even a little bit trained to do that kind of thing. That would be, that's a really interesting idea. I mean, I love this stuff. The child care, the family realm is like so non-innovative right now, right? Like everything else is like Jetsons, right? Except for the flying, you know, the flying cars and the little bubbles and everything. And then at home, it's just like, you know, Doris Day or who's the who's that famous one with the vacuum cleaner? Anyway, you guys know what I'm saying. Like we 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 hold on to these old fashioned stereotypes for domestic life that are just not serving anyone, honestly. I don't think they're serving anyone. So I think that all this, all this innovation, we'll see it. I, I'm not the only person thinking this way. I think we're gonna start seeing it more and more. I think so too. Yeah, we, we are not keeping up with the times at home, right? Even if you had somebody come online and teach your yeah. kids how to make a healthy snack when they got home from school, <laughs> just that, there's so much right. creative content that you can come up with experts that can do that, that would help a parent out right. who's on, who's working. Or meet them, like meet them where they are. Where, where are kids spending their free time? They like to be on their devices. We kind of need them to learn yeah, how to do that. That's where they're going to spend their whole careers too. So, um, so maybe it's, yeah. maybe it makes sense to have more of that interaction online be safe and useful. All right. We're all going to jump off. There goes Emma. Okay. Okay. Um, and I should go too, because it is almost six o'clock here in the night. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liz. I just, I appreciate you for sharing your story with us, having a conversation. This has been a great feeling of community. You've been impactful for more than you know, and for the community members that are going to watch us afterwards. So I appreciate you. Have a great night. Stay safe. And I appreciate everybody else that joined us today. Thanks, Thanks, Liz. Thanks for inviting Thanks, me. Everybody. It's really great getting to know you guys. All right. I hope we stay in touch. Bye.
Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.